Um, what I'd like to share with you a little bit today is kind of reframe your thinking back to the high schools that you're working with. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about two of the high schools that we're working with in the state of Missouri. And there are two very large, if you will, technology learning projects going on in those high schools. I didn't practice using the, the clicker. To the right, right now. To the right, the other right. Do I point it at you? No. There we go, all right. Little learning curve. Uh, New Franklin High School is right in the middle of central Missouri. Um, very small school district, uh, K through 12, all in one building. And I think you're gonna get a chance, hopefully, if the video will work, just to see what that building looks like. Built in 1908. Um, this school district is our uh, partner in the Investing in Innovation grant that we just received in 2010 from the U.S. Department of Education. We're working to validate how a careful, carefully devised technology suite, along with significant intensive professional development and teacher support, can truly transform and change student outcomes and teaching practice. Um, when I was just getting here this morning, Lauren and I were talking about some of the challenges in working with teachers and helping them understand what it is that the next step in technology is. And it's not because they're unwilling or they don't care or they're not interested. It's because so much is coming at them so fast that they really don't have a way to organize that into a channel that will help them with their day-to-day -day instruction. And I think some of our other speakers later today are going to share with you some of the kind of avalanche of things that are out there, uh, not only in terms of the technology itself, the devices, but all of the applications, the software, the different things that are available for teachers to work with in terms of their students. Well, New Franklin High School uh, has worked with us, like I said, for about the last six years. Um, they've done a lot of planning, a lot of processing. They have a one-to-one -one project. Teachers have laptops. There's interactive whiteboards, lots of peripherals in the classroom. We limit the software that's allowed on those computers for the first two years that the school's in the program because we do not want to develop an over-dependence on things that are already out there that are created. Rather, have teachers learn to use productivity software, uh, Microsoft has been a great partner with us, but we also have open source applications. Um, lots of different ways for teachers to think about restructuring their education. EMINS itself is, stands for Enhancing Missouri's Instructional Network Teaching Strategies. That's a lot. I just say it's a cool, refreshing way to think about teaching and learning. This school made a very long-term commitment started at the elementary level, worked up to middle, and finally high school. I'd like you to take a look at what's going on in um, their classrooms, if we can get the video to pull up. This is Prezi, by the way. This is different than PowerPoint. If you haven't seen Prezi, it's fun. social studies class are using multiple technologies to deepen their understanding of the First Amendment and religious freedom. Our fourth day we're using computers with internet research obviously to look up the Supreme Court cases. Uh, we have a smart board. Uh, with our smart board we have a remote desktop so up front we can see what each student's looking at. But come presentation time we'll be able to pull it straight off of their computer and just put it on the smart board. We'll sort of eliminate them having to save it to a certain format or whatever. Although we've taught them that in the past, it still sometimes becomes a problem, so we just sort of skip that step to help our cause. In this class, the students will use the internet to conduct research on their individual laptop computers. Mr. McGowan will be using an interactive whiteboard or smartboard to display computer pages, as well as a remote desktop application to view the students' computers. The interactive whiteboard is an extension of Mr. McGowan's computer. He can access this digital board as though his hand or a tool were the mouse and the board were the desktop. The students have been studying religious freedom. After a brief review, Mr. McGowan breaks the students into groups and assigns them a Supreme Court case dealing with religious freedom. 
Now, what I wanted you to see in that is not that this is startling new technology or fantastic applications, but it gets at many of the things that Glenn framed up for you in terms of what the vision may be for some for our schools that we're looking for. You, you would have seen collaboration. You saw writing to learn using media, um, using a full range of information and knowledge in their literacy groups. They're posing questions and posing problems, not just answering the questions that the teacher gives them, but actually learning how to pose meaningful, authentic problems and questions that they can then work with their colleagues, their classmates to solve. So that's New Franklin, and they have, they have been um, a really great role model for us in uh, our, our program. I'm going to switch now to another high school. You've probably heard of Joplin, Missouri. We were in the news quite a bit. Um, this particular school district also had a great vision for technology and what they wanted their students to do, and had a pretty well-refined technology suite that they were looking at for elementary and middle school had actually gotten quite a few classrooms set up, teachers trained. All of the teachers in the school district in Joplin have completed a minimum of 24 hours of immense professional development around how, not only how to use technology, but the pedagogy that's necessary for them to use it effectively. They were just getting into the uh, high school when May 22nd hit and an F5 tornado hit that community. This is what's left of their high school and their career center. Um, when we drove in there, I just was not prepared for it. Um, not only, you, couldn't, you couldn't even tell what the buildings used to be. Usually if there's a storm, you can say, oh well, there's a convenience store that got hit. Oh, there's a house that lost its roof. We could not even tell what the structures were. They were shredded into just piles of debris. And so that particular school district was faced with a challenge. What were they going to do for their students at that high school? They had exactly 60 days from the day this tornado struck, and they began to find out where their students were to pull off high school. Not only that, they lost two elementary schools and a middle school. So the amazing challenge that they had took them to what they were looking for in terms of how to figure out what to do for facilities, how were they going to use resources. And amazingly, in this particular community, one thing that they said over and over was, once we found out that everyone was safe, we knew what we had to do for insurance, the donations began coming in. It was an opportunity for them to create the 21st century schools that they were never going to have otherwise. So Education Week just last week reported on their progress. And there's, it's mixed results, partly because not only have they had a challenge in terms of putting their kids together in different school settings, two of their grades, 10th and 11th grade are out at the mall, uh, ninth and tenth, or eleventh and twelfth are out at the mall. Ninth and tenth are down at what used to be the old high school. So the kids are all split up. Teachers are all split up. It's been very challenging for them to keep their community of learners together. But they're doing that, and they're doing that through the uses of the technology that they've been able to secure. They also now have a one-to-one -one laptop program. And their particular schools, as I said, you could read in Education Week, just go back and look at Joplin, and there's quite a great video on that uh, too as well. We'll go to the next one here. Um, there were some commonalities here that I'd really like to bring out to you. And the first of that is one that you are really already focusing on, the vision, 21st century instruction, the project-based learning aligned to standards. And I spoke with some folks yesterday from North Carolina uh, Public Instruction were telling me how North Carolina has adopted the core standards and not common core standards and is moving towards implementing them this coming school year, along with revisions to all of the other standards that they have for the state. So the project-based learning, whether it's done through a flipped instructional model or whether it's done in a way that really 
teachers and students come together and create the projects that are necessary for them to transform their learning. There are many models for that, but that vision is very common in the schools that we work with that have success. And then that technology is a tool for the transformation of teaching and learning. It is not an add-on. It's not a place you go to where the computer lab is scheduled. It's not a distributed piece of the resources. It's ubiquitous and it's there throughout the school day and throughout the ways that students learn and work even off school hours. In New Franklin, um, much of the community there does not have high-speed internet. They're simply too remote in terms of ruralness. But they have had to alert their police department that it's okay if they see cars parked in the parking lot after school's over and uh, kids walking around in the warm weather. They're using the internet, the wireless, that's available to them from their school and they can pick it up outside the school. And they really want to learn and work with that, that technology. So the vision is something you're going to be providing and I know that's critical. The other piece that's important is the high quality professional development. Now, we've talked a lot about EMINs and um, these are the types of uh, qualities that you want to look for in high quality professional development. Go to the National Staff Development Council or Learning Forward as they're now called and you can read all about, and I put a little white paper together about the qualities of pro high quality professional development. I know Barbara's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Our teachers at Joplin who had uh, classrooms with EMINTS, these little signs were outside each of the classrooms as a way to identify and help uh, people know what was going on in those classrooms. When the demolition crew went to reclaim what they could from that high school that I showed you, they met with the teachers and asked them, uh, what would you like us to look for? Certain books, certain lab materials. The EMINTS teacher said, if you could find our EMINTS signs, it would mean so much to us. The identifying of a teacher with a program that helps them move kids through the transformation of learning is something that I think is a missing ingredient or a missing element in a lot of projects or programs. Teachers need and crave that identity and community. And for you to be focusing on how to provide that community is incredible, very incredible. So I applaud you for that and uh, look forward to talking with you more about it. You're providing that leadership. Thank you. All right, well thank, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll now uh, ask to, uh, to uh, engage our panel. In, uh, for me, a couple of key takeaways here is that there are two components here, both what we teach and how we teach. 